The Peter Schiff Show. Well, we had some wild swings in the markets today, particularly the stock market and the gold market. At one point this morning, the Dow Jones was down about 270 points, and it finished the day up 53 points. Now, there wasn't any real news that came out to cause the market to go up. It just went up. I mean, people, I guess, started buying just because they wanted to, you know, buy the dip. I don't know. People, you know, the market went down, so people came in and bought. The oil market also turned around. Crude was down about a buck and change and managed to close up about 20, 30 cents. A lot of people wanted to say that it's because crude oil rallied that the market rallied, but I don't think it's cause and effect. I think they were both rising for the same reasons. Gold, of course, was the mirror image. Gold at one point this morning when the Dow was down near the lows was up about $27, $28. I mean, we were back above twelve fifty, And then when the stock market rallied back, the gold market sold off, managed to uh, close out with a small $3 gain or so. Gold stocks finished the day mixed. Uh, most of them still positive on the day but some slightly negative, although way off their highs. I mean, most of these stocks this morning were up 5 6 7 8%, yet they finished up maybe 1% or 2%, if that, and a few of them actually managed to be slightly negative. But, you know, the people who are you know day trading now in the gold stocks or in gold, and they think that the only reason gold is going up is because the stock market is going down, that's not it. I mean, the reason that the stock market falling is positive for gold is because of the effect that a falling stock market is going to have on the Fed and its decisions with respect to future interest rate hikes. If the market is collapsing, Fed officials have already said that that's a concern and that they don't want to raise rates into a very weak stock market. So I think every time the stock market goes down, that's one of the reasons that you see people going into gold is because of the effect that the weak market's going to have on, on the Fed. But even if the stock market's not going down, the Fed is still going to be reversing on rates because of the economy. The economy is back in recession. Whether the Fed wants to acknowledge that fact or not, that's the reality. And the fact is we had another Fed official on uh, giving a speech this morning, Lacker, who actually came out, and this is probably one of the reasons the market sold off so heavily, although it was down anyway before Lacker opened his mouth. But basically, he said that he sees no signs of a recession, right? that there's no signs that would say a recession is imminent, and he sees no reason why the Fed wouldn't go forward with its rate hikes. Now, of course, he is you know, one of the supposed hawks on the Fed, but just making a statement so asinine that he sees no signs of a recession? I mean, what is this guy, blind? Or maybe it's because he's just looking at everything through rose-colored glasses. Maybe those are like standard issue over at the Fed, that they, they give everybody a pair of rose-colored glasses, and that's part of the deal. And so everything they look at is tinted uh, from that perspective. But there is ample evidence that there is uh, a recession. Now, if a, if a guy like Lacker were to be honest and say, look, the economy looks pretty bad. We're probably going to a recession, but rates are really low and the Fed has got to raise them anyway. And so, you know, this is just going to be difficult because we have to raise rates in a recession, but we got to raise them, right? But they're not saying that. They're saying we're going to raise rates because the economy is in great shape. They're not saying we're going to raise rates even though the economy is in lousy shape because if they admitted the economy was in lousy shape, they don't have the integrity to raise rates. So they want to continue to pretend that everything is great, but this is a very, very dangerous game that the Fed is is playing because everything is not great. And not only do they risk making it worse, but they risk losing whatever credibility they manage to have left when it turns out that all these guys who are saying there's no recession anywhere in sight are in the middle of the recession. Here is some of the economic news that came out later today, right? So this is after Lack, Lacker spoke. But of course, there's plenty of bad news that, that came out prior to Lacker's talk that he could have seen as indications of a recession, of signs of a recession. But he is ignoring all that. 
So at 9.45 this morning, we got the February PMI Services Index, Flash Service Index for February. Now, this is the services part of the economy, right? It's not manufacturing, right? This is supposedly the strong part of the economy. And last month, the number was 53.7. And the consensus was to uh, repeat that number, another 53.7. The range of the consensus was from as low as 52.8 to as high as 54. The number came out at 49.8. A disaster. 49.8. This is in contraction. And what this shows is that the recession was not contained to manufacturing. That's what everybody has been saying. And I you know, said that reminded me of what they said about subprime. Don't worry about it. It's contained to subprime. The rest of the market is fine. That was nonsense. And it is nonsense again. The problems in the economy are not contained to manufacturing. And today's numbers prove it because the service sector contracted in February. Now, the last time this happened was in October of 2013. And the significant factor there, right, this is the last time that uh, index was below 50. That was during the government shutdown, right? That was the month the government shut down. And so a lot of government services were not available because the government was shut down. And so that's an outlier. You can throw that statistic out. So if you take that out, the last time We had a service sector PMI below 50. We were in the Great Recession. So again, we have another indicator uh, that is flashing recession because it only happens when either we're in a recession or we're having a government shutdown. And the last I looked, the government wasn't shut down. Unfortunately, they were still operating. So we must be in a recession. Now, what's amazing to me is that the Atlanta Fed still hasn't walked down their 2.6% forecast for the, uh, the the first quarter because we've gotten so much bad news since they ratcheted it up on some flimsy good news. And we've got a lot worse news on the bad side since they you know increased their estimate, yet they've done nothing to downwardly revise it. I mean, this doesn't seem right to me. I mean, again, I think that the Federal Reserve uh, reined these guys in. The FOMC might have said, hey, Guys over there in Atlanta, get with the program, right? I mean, we're talking about, we're about talking up the economy. Stop coming up with these negative forecasts. You got to, you know, put a, put a positive spin on everything. And it looks like that's what they're doing because they haven't done anything to take down these numbers. Now, you know, on Friday, we're going to get the revised numbers for the fourth quarter, which was originally reported as up 0.7. I think that's going to get revised down. In fact, the consensus is for revision down to 0.4. Uh, So we're getting closer and closer to zero. But the numbers we're getting in the first quarter actually show that the first quarter could be worse than the fourth quarter, despite the the rosy scenario that the the Federal Reserve of Atlanta is is currently painting uh, for for that number. Also, after we got the uh, service sector PMI, we got new home sales, which was a disaster. Uh, They were looking for... 520,000 and we got 494,000. That was a big, big miss. uh, And it's the lowest level in a couple of years. So more indications, despite uh, super low mortgage rates, that, you know, the economy is not in as good a shape as people think. In fact, we got a couple of uh, corporate earnings that came out today that were disappointing. Look what happened to Avis. Avis stock was down 26% on the day. On the day, the stock closed at 2204, right? And that's with the big market rally, right? It didn't include uh, Avis. They didn't go along for that ride. Down 26% on the day. This stock is down better than 60%, maybe 63% from where it was a year ago. Now, if the consumer is in such great shape, why can't he afford to rent a car? Especially with all this cheap gas. You know, I heard that again on this morning on CNBC. I mean, I kid you not... There was a conversation and they were just talking about the strength of the consumer and why the consumer is so strong. And so this economy is, you know, is going to be able to shrug a lot of this off based on the strength of the consumer. What are they basing this on? 
I mean, where is everybody getting the idea that the American consumer is so strong? Because none of this is true. I mean, first of all, we got, what, 47 million Americans on food stamps? How strong are those consumers? How much are you consuming if you're on food stamps? I mean, I'm assuming not very much, because otherwise you wouldn't qualify for food stamps. But number two, even the consumers who are not on food stamps are not doing that well. I mean, based on what do they think the consumer is doing well? Because the unemployment rate is low? I mean, but if if you're only not unemployed because you got a lousy, low-paying, part-time job, that doesn't mean you're pretty flush. You know, the average American consumer has no savings and he lives paycheck to paycheck. So if he loses his job, he can't pay his bills. And, and, you know, if there's an emergency, something comes up, if there's the car breaks down and it's not on warranty and it's you, you don't have 500 bucks to fix it. And the average American has lots of debt, auto loans, student loans, credit card debt. Yes, overall, right, debt has come down. But that's because people don't have houses anymore. I've said that before. A lot of people who used to have mortgages no longer have mortgages. Yes, so that debt is off their balance sheet. But so is their house. <laughs> so they no longer have home equity. So you got all these Americans who used to have home equity who now have none. Why are they in such good shape? Why would the consumer be strong if you took away his biggest asset and the hope that that asset was going to make money? Because it's not. Now, people don't have that. You know, I recently got my house appraised because I'm, I'm doing a refinance. And when I got the appraisal, they appraised a lot that my house is sitting on. Just forgetting about because they, but you know, what is the land worth? Forget about the house. What's the land worth? And according to the appraiser, the lot where my house in Connecticut was appraised at 500000 for for the lot. Now, this lot was bought by a developer in 2000 who then built a house and sold it to the guy who sold it to me. So the original house that was built was built in 2002. My lot was purchased by the developer in 2000. That developer paid $850,000 for that lot. In 2000, this is 2016, 16 years later, and that $850,000 lot is now worth $500,000 after 16 years. And of course, every year you got to pay property taxes on the value of the property. Even if, even if there was never a house built on this land, the owner of that land, had they owned that piece of property for 16 years, would have been paying about, I don't know, $12,000 I think would be the property tax just on the land every year for 16 years. But the other thing that people don't consider is my lot is nicer now than it was 16 years ago. There's been a lot of landscaping that's been done. There's been hundreds of thousands of dollars of trees planted that weren't even there when the lot was worth $850,000. There's beautiful trees now all over my property, huge evergreens that weren't there, lots of uh, flowering trees. And I don't know if it counts the fact that now there's a driveway, a long driveway with brick pavers on it. There's a gate, you know, electronic gate. I'm not even sure if that's even included, but even forgetting about that. But my point is everybody in Connecticut, I'm, you know, I'm less than an hour drive from Midtown Manhattan. I mean, I'm in prime commuting area for people who, you know, work on Wall Street and live in Connecticut. And this is what's happened to the value of the land. So this is happening all around the country. I mean, maybe not in every part of it, but... You're talking about people who used to, you know, their biggest asset was their house, right? Now they don't have that anymore. And back when people were living in the days of the real estate bubble, people, consumers believed that their real estate was going to keep on rising in value. And so they spent money more freely. How can the consumer be in good shape now when if he owns land, the land that he owns is less valuable than it was 16 years ago. In the meantime, he's got no savings. He hasn't saved any money in the last 16 years. He was counting on his house, and that didn't work out. So this idea that the consumer is in good shape when he doesn't have a house, his rent's going up every year, he's underemployed, he's got lots of credit card debt, he's got no savings, maybe he's got a student loan, or maybe his kids are still living with him. Or maybe he's a kid, he's still living with his parents, and he's, you know, he's 20s or 30s. I mean, the consumer is all messed up, and these earnings are proving it. In fact, after the bell today, Restoration Hardware, 
that's a nice store. I bought some stuff at Restoration Hardware. Apparently, not too many other people did because the stock is down 20% after hours because their earnings were horrible in the fourth quarter. Last quarter, this stock, Restoration Hardware, is trading at about 40 bucks after hours. In December, the stock was $100. So you're talking about three months, less than three months, stock's down 60%. I mean, these, these retailers are dropping like flies. And you've got Fed officials out there saying there's no sign of a recession. No sign of a recession. Earnings are collapsing at retailers. People are talking about the strong consumer. Well, he can't afford to rent a car and he can't buy anything at restoration hardware. I mean, there is no strength here. And talk about no sign of a recession. What about a PMI in February that is contracting? Negative below 50. I mean, if that's not a sign of a recession, what is it a sign of? Now, I wonder if all these economists who keep you know, coming out there talking about how strong the consumer is, are they just reading off of a script? I mean, is that just, you know, everybody gets passed out this memo, you know, the consumer is so strong, the economy is in good shape, and they just believe it. Do they not, you know, even look at any of the data that comes out that would fly in the face of such an absurd pronouncement? You know, if the American consumer was doing so well. Why would Donald Trump be kicking butt? Why would he have gotten, what, 45% of the vote in, in Nevada if the consumer was doing so good? I mean, the people voting for Trump are voting for him because they're not doing good, and they're, and they're hoping that Trump can solve their problems. Right? Same thing with Bernie Sanders on the left. If the consumer was doing so good, they'd want four more years with Hillary. They wouldn't want Bernie's socialism. The reason they want it is because they, the last thing they want is four more years because they're in lousy shape. And obviously, I mean, it makes sense given everything else that's going around. Why would people think the American consumer is, is so powerful? I mean, we are done, right? Americans already consume too much. That's part of the problem. We racked up all this credit card debt, buying things that we couldn't afford. And now we got the hangover. You know, now people now I hear people trying to say, well, people don't want to buy things anymore. You know, they want experiences, <laughs> you know, trying to explain why, you know, sales are going down. Well, how much are people actually spending on these so-called experience? Yeah, what they're experiencing is poverty. What they're experiencing is a lack of a job. That's that. That's what they're experiencing. Yeah, of course, people want things. They just can't afford things. And you know what? They bought so much stuff. Maybe they don't they realize they don't need a new thing. They can make do with what they got. Right. Because they don't need to go into debt to buy something else. They'll just make whatever they have last a little longer. And that's what's going on. The one place that people have bought has been in, in, in the automobiles. But th this is going to be another disaster when, you know, all the people who bought these cars, when they lose their jobs and they don't want to make the car payments anymore. And the lenders are going to be stuck with all these cars. And, of course, all these leases that were made a few years ago. Uh, when these leases mature and the leasees turn in the cars, the resale value of these cars is not going to be anything near what was assumed when the lease was made because the residual value of the car is probably the most important factor in your lease payments. I mean, the interest rates are nothing because it's basically zero. So really what the cost of the lease is, is how much is the car worth when you bought it and what's it going to be worth as a used car when the company who leased it to you has to turn around and sell it. And it's that depreciation that base, that makes all your payments. Well, if it turns out that the car is depreciated a lot more, then the, the lender ends up with a huge loss, which is exactly what's going to happen because all these cars are going to be turned in and there's not going to be a vibrant market for them because the market's going to implode. So that, but every place else, spending is, is collapsing. These, the retailers here are dropping like flies. I mean, every once in a while, somebody's going to report better than expected earnings. But, you know, those are the exceptions. The rule is almost every one of these companies is reporting disappointing results. Now, now would they be doing that if the consumer was so strong? And this is, you know, this is fourth quarter. This is like during the holiday shopping season. So if consumers weren't spending for Christmas... How much are they going to spend in January and February or March? So if their sales were really bad in the fourth quarter, they ain't going to get any better in the first quarter. Meanwhile, I think the, the sell-off that we got in the gold stocks from the highs earlier this morning, I think we're going to ultimately make new highs. I don't think this is any kind of reversal that we had today. I think that you just have too many people 
that are trading on these algorithms, or maybe you're looking at, oh, the U.S. stock market rises, I got to sell gold. But ultimately, I think this is still early on in this uh, in this gold rally. In fact, I think there was a gold stock. I think Yamana was downgraded today uh, to a to a sell from a hold. I think it was maybe it was Goldman Sachs. I forget who who did the downgrade. But I haven't seen one upgrade so far. We've seen Newmont got a downgrade. Newcrest Mining in Australia got a downgrade. I mean, every single gold stock that I've seen in the last month, even though some of these stocks have tripled. You can find gold stocks that have tripled in the last month. Some have doubled. Some are only up 50% or whatever, but I mean, they're all way up. And during the entire time, the only thing I've seen from Wall Street is a downgrade. Nobody has upgraded a stock. It's all been anytime they, the stocks have been up, oh, let's downgrade it to, to a sell. Even if they didn't have it as a buy, they went from a hold to a sell. Well, if you never bought it, how are you supposed to sell it? The only advice you got was to hold it. But to me, this dish is so much upside here. Wall Street is still living in complete denial because the Fed's in denial. Because you got guys like Lacker coming out and saying, everything looks great. Yep, we're going to be raising rates. And that is what's supporting the dollar. And that is what's also keeping the pressure on a lot of these uh, emerging markets is this belief that the Fed's going to raise rates. But, you know, when I think about it, if you really think the stock market's going down, you're much better off just buying gold instead of shorting stocks. Because if the market goes down, gold's going up, right? So it's like, because it, they, they trade almost, as I said, as a mirror image. But the difference is, if the Fed comes out and says, yep, the economy's weak, we're cutting rates, or we're not going to raise rates, or we're launching QE4, the Fed comes out and acknowledges reality, and you're short stocks, you're going to get hurt. Because all the stocks are going to rally on that news. But gold will rally even more. And I think gold stocks too. So I think you there's a, you can make money both ways. Because until the Fed acknowledges this reality, until they capitulate, that's going to keep downward pressure on the market, which is going to keep upward pressure on gold and gold mining stocks. And when the Fed admits that the economy is weak and that it's going to change policy to stop the stock market from going down and stimulate the economy, then gold stocks and gold go up even more. That's an even better environment than the one that we're in now. And I can't imagine the Fed waiting too much longer because, A, I know there's a lot of pressure from Wall Street on the Fed to reverse policy. There's a lot of pressure from the White House. I mean, imagine, because Barack Obama doesn't want um, Donald Trump to be the next president. He wants Hillary Clinton. Because if Hillary Clinton is the next president, Barack Obama is going to have a lot more fun in a Hillary Clinton administration. He's going to be invited to a lot more White House functions. He's going to be more popular. Plus, a lot of his same guys that work for Obama will get jobs working for Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so Obama wants that. Plus, it's a, a validation of his presidency, right? He wants to be able to hand the baton uh, to Hillary. So he doesn't want Donald Trump to be the next president. So he must be putting a lot of pressure on the Fed because the longer the Fed waits to do something, the harder it's going to be to turn something around. Uh, they can't admit, oh, yep, there's a recession right before the election. They need to do something now to try to get us beyond that foreign events, beyond its control. They can still pretend if they want to that the economy is okay, but they got to do something to stop the bleeding and, and start doing some stimulus. They need an excuse. So I can't imagine that there's going to be too much more time that's going to go by. I mean, the Fed does want to distance itself. It wants more time between the rate hike and the rate cut, but they don't have that much time. That's the problem. Time is running out. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. 
Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with TruthinMedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, TruthinMedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make TruthinMedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit TruthinMedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access to Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Access to Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.